Could the center of Bitcoin mining move from the east to the west? Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Kim. I'm going to be talking now about the growing cryptocurrency mining industry in North America. And while I don't have a funny dad joke to start off the show with, I assure you there will be a lot of good nuggets of information and insight to mine out of our conversation here today. So with that rather embarrassing pun now that I think about it <laughs> out of the way, I'll be introducing my panelists. We have today the CEO of Hive Blockchain Technologies, Frank Holmes. Hi, Frank. Hello. I've also got the CEO of Layer One, Alex Legal. Hi, Alex. Hey, how's it going? And last but not least, I've also got the CFO of Luxor Technologies, Ethan Vera. Hey, Christine. Thanks for having us on. It's great to have you guys with the Bitcoin having about to be coming up in just, what is it, around 30 minutes? I have to ask, where's the party at? How are you guys going to be celebrating after this show, Frank? Well, it's all a matter of how fast we can see the price rise, I think, for most people. But for us, we just started really going into uh, Bitcoin in a large, larger way. We've been predominantly well known for Ethereum mining. Interesting. Ethereum mining. Ethereum doesn't have anything like the halving or these pre-programmed subsidy uh, reductions. In perhaps a more, more serious question on that note, there are specific metrics that people should be watching out for after the halving occurs. Alex, I want to ask you, what are the blockchain metrics, the market metrics that you're going to be watching right after the halving? Um, so first of all, after this, I'm going straight back to work. No celebrating yet. <laughs> um, there's only two factors I look at, just hash rate and price. Otherwise, everything else is just internal. Ethan, would Correct. you agree with that? Hash rate and price, is that all you look at? Yeah, uh, essentially looking at what the value of hash rate is. So uh, revenue right now is about 14 cents per terahash. Uh, it's going to drop down to around 7 cents in let's call it 30 minutes. So um, that's going to be a big drop there. Uh, definitely looking forward to seeing what the next difficulty adjustment is, um, which should happen in about seven days. So hopefully that will bring that uh, revenue, um, you know, dollars per terahash back up to nine, 10 cents a terahash. That's a really great point, Ethan. And once the Bitcoin having drops, I am going to be doing a quick update on the price and also be getting your thoughts on whether or not Bitcoin price is really responding in the way that you guys expected. Um, but before I move on to that, I do also want to get um, your perspective, all of your guys' perspective on how miners are feeling about how the Bitcoin markets have moved so far. So we've got the Bitcoin having, we've got COVID-19, and Bitcoin hit $10,000 last Thursday. Is this bullish, very bullish times for miners? What is the miner sentiment in North America? Frank? Well, I think it's very bullish and very constructive. Uh, I know ourselves, during this uh, lockdown, we still made an acquisition and we expanded into Quebec, Canada uh, for that great uh, inexpensive green energy, like four cents, uh, slightly less than four cents a kilowatt. Um, and it's uh, and we were able to buy things where the people are distressed or changing and leaving. So we're very thrilled about, but they, uh, I guess, start mining right away. The 30 megawatts of energy we have. We started with some S9s and mm -hmm. we just implemented and uh, some S17s on the weekend. And we'll continue to invest in and build out our S17s in Quebec. Very cool. I thank you for those updates on what you guys have been working on and machines that you guys have been updating. Alex, do you want to talk a little bit about your perspective on how you're feeling given the events of this year? Um, what are you thinking about as a mining company? Um, we feel great. Um, very simple. We're just focused on um, you know measuring our inputs. The outputs will take care of ourselves. Um, at this point, we have by far the cheapest electricity at scale, the liquid cooling um, patent pending technology in order to take advantage of it, the capability to uh, participate in demand response management, um, just because of the unique software platform that we've built, feeling better and stronger than ever. I think this year is just about executing. I think the uh, Bitcoin having is a forcing function for every miner and sort of the increasing maturation of the industry. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it will just lead to um, 
the industry developing further. I think we're currently where oil was in 1890. I think what's missing is um, some type of stratification within the industry, you know, a standard oil um, for Bitcoin mining. You know, obviously we're biased. I think that's, you know, the potential that we have. I'm sure that other companies are also vying for that spot. Um, I think it's a perfect storm, you know, in terms of what hmm. you addressed about Corona, about the price, right. about the hash rate and so forth. And we'll right. have a very good outcome. On the topic of Corona, actually, Ethan, I know that Luxor Technologies is also mining out of North America. Has COVID-19 impacted any of your guys' mining operations in a negative way? Yeah, the, the COVID effect uh, was, was mostly a couple months ago uh, when China had shut down. Uh, shipping uh, was delayed for a lot of those new machines and then uh, air freight uh, went up. So it used to be around like $60 per miner, uh, went up to $160. So uh, you did see that additional boost in you know the capex that you need to spend to deploy. Um, but since then, it's definitely uh, recovered a lot. Uh, miners are being shipped out of China on time. Uh, a lot of these Chinese companies now are also shipping out of the Malaysian subsidiaries. So um, they, they ship out of there to basically avoid the 25% tariff. So um, in terms of COVID, there, there really isn't much impact in the market right now for mining. Hmm. But what evidence is there, you know, despite COVID, despite those disruptions in supply chain that happened a couple months ago, that mining in North America is actually growing and growing at a pace faster than we've seen before, Frank? Well, I, I think the big part is is ease. Um, when we're in Europe, we have such challenges with VAT tax and trying to navigate between Sweden and Iceland uh, and where coins are going. It's very complex. Uh, in North America, it's much more simple process. And there's many pockets of green energy that's showing up that's also quite inexpensive. And pockets of this sort of stranded electricity. So uh, I think that there's more interest uh, the barriers to entry are, are very um, evolved now in North America. I'm glad that you actually brought up the topic of green energy because I want to get your guys' thoughts on surplus energy mining. For our audience who doesn't know what that is, that's when miners leverage the energy, excess energy, coming from hydropower plants, natural gas power plants at zero or even sub-zero cost levels. I've heard that a certain city in China is advertising to crypto miners of their excess hydroelectric energy. Is surplus energy mining a possibility here in North America? Is it a strength here in North America? What are your guys' thoughts on that, Alex or Ethan? Um, sure. Um, so I think I think there's two ways actually to your, uh, to this opportunity. One, you know, like you're referring to, there's companies offering, for example, for fracking uh, for uh you know natural gas flaring and so forth i think there's the bottleneck here is just scalability you cannot actually deploy that much megawatts uh at a at a flaring site um i think what's actually interesting is if you if you think about sort of what you're able to do is um energy produces before the business model was can i produce energy more cheaply than i can sell it for in the market and um effectively um, that also pertains right to wind, uh, solar, uh, hydro, and so forth. I think the interesting opportunity here now is uh, all of a sudden you can actually uh, multiply the business model that energy producers have by saying, hey, look, um, if market prices are unfavorable, you can actually profitably consume that electricity yourself on site. Um, you know, you have that coupled with a lot of politicians are, you know, extremely excited about renewable energy. What they mostly forget about is just the transmission grid infrastructure. Um, so actually, you create a lot of stranded assets that cannot de deliver the power that they produce. The opportunity here is you build large scale sites uh, located at these energy plants. So effectively, you create, you know, a type of supercomputer that produces and consumes its own electricity and then actually the opposite of what you're saying is it feeds that excess electricity and sells that into the market um, you know thereby technically creating uh, sort of the converse um, of that you know original notion hmm interesting Alex e interesting Alex Ethan what interests you about surplus energy mining and do you agree that it is scaling like Alex had said that is the real issue here that needs to be um, overcome 
Yeah, uh, scaling on the flared gas side is definitely an issue, but I think it, it is a really good story for Bitcoin. Um, and, and just to like specify what that means is uh, w- when these oil wells produce oil, they also produce some excess gas, and it's not usually not enough gas to justify building a pipeline to get it to market. Uh, so what the companies usually do is vent it into the air or flare it, which is uh, burning it up. Um, so companies like uh, Upstream Data, Crusoe, um, they're basically putting these mobile Bitcoin units, uh, mining units into those um, sites. And instead of now um, the, these oil wells burning that excess electricity, now they're turning it into you know, security for the Bitcoin network. Um, so th- these types of uh, projects are, are actually beneficial from a carbon uh, standpoint to the earth. So uh, really good story for Bitcoin. Um, excited to see that grow. I think what um, Alex is talking about is uh, potentially more scalable. Um, so, you know, excited to see both of those grow together. Totally. And I will say, I love talking about mining technology, about talking about liquid cooling and surplus energy mining. It's really going to be something to continue to watch for. One other thing that I want to ask you guys, it's a rumor that I've heard. Apparently, cryptocurrency mining operations in the southern part of the U.S. and states such as Texas are having to shut down due to weather-related conditions such as heating, hum- high humidity, high humidity. Is it true that mining operations in these certain parts of North America are simply infeasible and uncompetitive on the global, uh, on the, on the global stage, Frank? Well, I, I think that best leader to one of our other guests here, they have much more expertise in Texas than I live in Texas, uh, but I'm not doing any mining in Texas. Yeah, let's hand it actually over you. That's a great point. Let's hand it over to Alex or Ethan. Tell me, is it true that these mining operations are simply unfeasible in those areas? Um, I can tell you if you have what we have, then you can absolutely take advantage of it. You know, I won't speak about other companies, but I think we put a lot of work and spent a lot of capital and uh, invested a lot of energy and I mean, literally and figuratively. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think we're in a very good spot now in terms of uh, net effect of electricity rates and taking advantage of 100 degrees, uh, you know, Fahrenheit weather. Hmm. Ethan, any concerns that jump out in your mind when it comes to uh, mining in North America in certain conditions of the North American continent? Yeah, th- there's always uh, concerns, uh, whether it's too cold of weather in Montana or, or Quebec um, or, or too hot in Texas. But there are innovative solutions um, that are being uh, deployed in these data centers to help with that. So um, I think Alex has some uh, interesting immersion cooling that's proprietary, but there's there's other companies too that are also doing uh, liquid immersion. So um, I don't think it's a concern long term. Uh, I'm pretty bullish on uh, North American mining and and mining in Texas. So I think the the companies that are building out there um, are doing it in a way that will you know be able to um, you know take into consideration the, the the weather and and the temperature of uh, Texas. Just to add to that, actually, if you don't mind, and I agree with Ethan, I mean, you know, if you think about what a shoebox miner is, right, air-cooled, it's it's cargo cult, effectively, right? I mean, the insanity is you have, in some facilities, tens of thousands of these, they accumulate dust, humidity, people literally have to pick them up and shake them out, right? I mean, mean, it's insane, right? It's a relic of the past, and and sort of, it's going to be a historical artifact of where we're at, but if people sort of, uh, you know, forecast that you sort of just, that's the game that you play, you're going to be crushed after this having pretty simple, right? Really the future is you build Bitcoin factory factories. Talking about the future of one of the things we're looking at, one of the things we're looking at in Sweden is, is horticulture and building a greenhouse at the back uh, because the cost of moving tomatoes from Spain up to Sweden, et cetera, so we can recycle this energy uh, all through the winter season. Gotcha. Thanks for that, Frank. Speaking of the future of Bitcoin mining, I do want to talk a little bit about those competitive advantages of miners in different parts of the world. Frank, you had mentioned Sweden. We're talking about, uh, I know Alex and Ethan, you guys have a lot of expertise on North America. Right now, the center of Bitcoin mining is centered in Asia. A lot of those reasons, be it historical, be it you know cheap electricity costs, I want to know, what are the advantages for North American miners? What 
if you could put on a advertisement of here's why you should mine in North America. Can you talk, talk a little bit about the pros uh, here, here mining here in, in North America? Ethan, let's start with you. One of the um, often not talked about areas is, is regulation. So uh, regulation probably has uh, held the U.S. back to certain degrees at the start of an industry. But I think long term, having um, further regulation helps you think more long term and build out better products. So a specific area around uh, products like cloud mining, where um, because those are unregulated in China and Russia, uh, those cloud mining platforms continue to thrive. Whereas in the U.S., the regulators take a much more uh, a harder stance on them. So uh, companies that are looking to build more sophisticated financial instruments really um, are, are thinking more long term um, and thinking how they can actually add value to miners. So I'm really excited for some of the financial instruments being built out for mining, mining in North America. And I think that's going to be uh, a large impact. I think a lot of the North American investors have stayed on the sideline because of uh, the lack of financial instruments, not being able to hedge your future revenue. So uh, having that ability, I think, will issue in a new um, new level of capital uh, from institutional North American investors. That's a really great point. Hedging for Bitcoin miners. Actually, we have one more block to go for our, the Bitcoin having event. And with that, I do want to introduce two more hosts. I want to introduce my colleagues, Galen Moore and Noel Ackeson, to this conversation. Uh, we've got our three North American mi miners here ready to answer your questions. Thanks, guys, for coming back on. Well, we do have some breaking news, Christine. The halving has happened. Block 63,000, 630,000 has been mined. Congrats. Great. That's great to hear. And try to contain yourselves, everyone. <laughs> it is quite, I'm, I've been wondering about this, this all day. Yeah. It is just a code change. Why are we so excited about this? Also, it's not like it's a surprise and yet it feels, I won't say emotional, but we've been hitting the refresh button nonstop all day. Why is that? Why does this feel important? Galen, what do you think? To me, it's just a learning moment. There's nothing, there's no substitute for actual practical learning. Uh, I think, you know, for miners in the room, right, that's people operating mining uh, equipment, that's sort of uh, um, th that kind of learning is old hat, if you will. Uh, for me, having been involved in crypto assets since 2017, I didn't really have the same opportunities to mine Bitcoin uh, as you might have as a hobbyist in the old days, right? But today, I have the opportunity to watch this event happen and to sort of think about uh, how Bitcoin works in a different way. The price, you know, it's not, uh, I, I haven't, I, we're not seeing it jump and I don't, uh, I don't expect to see it go through the roof. I'm not a big having bull. Uh, but again, just for me as a kind of a nerd, the uh, getting into the sort of the mechanics of how Bitcoin, uh, how Bitcoin acts on the network, it's a powerful thing. And I think it's a, I think it's a powerful thing for a lot of newcomers. So Brick, coming back to uh, the Bitcoin having in this topic, Frank, uh, Ethan and Alex, I do want to ask you guys, was was Bitcoin price hitting the 10K mark last Thursday where it's at around 8000 now? Is that where you suspected price would go? Um, it's no longer a mystery now, the price of Bitcoin at the time of the having. I'm sure it's still going to be a mystery a month from now since we don't know what's going to be happening then. But I'm curious to know, is this what you guys had expected around $8,000 as Galen had mentioned, Frank? Well, I think we're going to get the volatility we just experienced. But if I take a look at my experience in the capital markets of looking at uh, energy prices, you know, we did have uh, oil over $120 a barrel until the frackers came along. And that was a paradigm shift that impacted the supply. And then just a matter of time before all of a sudden prices start falling. This is the reverse. And this is where the supply is being pulled back. And in the, in the metals market, we had this happen in palladium. Uh, palladium supply was slowly contracting, contracting, and then last year it went from 1000 to $2,700 an ounce. And uh, it happened so uh, quickly and it surprised so many people. So I think that this is very bullish. Uh, however, over the next three months will be the test of it and the volatility of it, but I think it goes to $14,000. Alex, I, I have to say, what's your response to the best case, case scenario of 14,000? Is that something you also share? Um, 
I'm, I'm not that bullish on Bitcoin for the rest of the year, to be honest. Um, I think a decoupling will come once we actually have sort of, you know, monetary inflation pressure, either through demand side or supply side. I don't see from a sort of deflationary perspective um, anything really coming to um, fruition until the end of the year. So um, I think it's going to hover around its current price uh, for the next uh, uh, until the remainder of the year. And Ethan, final predictions from your side, given what you heard right now from our other two panelists. I'm bullish long term. Uh, I wouldn't be in the industry, you know, otherwise, but I uh, tend not to get in the business of, of speculating on price. Uh, look at it more from the mining perspective. So I was really surprised that we hit 120 exahash on the network um, at this price level. I think we're going to start to see at least 30 exahash fall off uh, in the coming uh, days. So um, expecting a big decrease in hash rate there as a lot of those old gen machines and then the higher cost producers also go offline. So um, we'll be watching that carefully over the next six days before the, the next difficulty adjustment. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ethan, Alex, and Frank for being on the show. It was great to get your guys' commentary and insight. I want to put 